So, any questions on uh, the first part of the lecture? Are there any, and if there are any, now would be a good time to ask them? An even better time to ask them would have been in the process. But now is good time to... Okay, in that case, let us continue and talk about the liquidity risk. So, in the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned that uh, the thing about liquidity is not just that it is imperfect, that illiquidity exists in the market, but furthermore, it is not constant over time. It fluctuates over time, which gives you liquidity risk. On top of that, liquidity of any given asset fluctuates over time, and it may be arbitrarily correlated across assets and across the whole market. So all of these risk factors can and are actually priced in the real markets. To see a simple illustration of how this works, let us use the liquidity capm model of Acharya and Pedersen from 2005. See, we're, uh, we are venturing into the uh, slightly fresher literature. So, a quick, uh, this liquidity capm model bases on the regular capital asset pricing model. I assume that you have seen it in your introductory finance or corporate finance courses. Have you seen it? But yes. Good. This inspires me with confidence. Still, just in case, here's a quick refresher of how it looks and uh, just to make sure we're on the same page that we're understanding the same thing under CAPM. Basically, the most important thing about CAPM is that you should pronounce it as CAPM, that all the insiders pronounce it as CAPM. That's the most important knowledge that you can get from any finance course. Uh, but the second most important insight of the CAPM model, the result, is that the expected return... Okay is that the expected return on a given asset J is um, given by some risk-free return in the market plus the risk premium. And this risk premium is given by... Um, is proportional to the covariance between returns of this particular asset and the average returns on the market portfolio. The idea behind CAPM, again, you probably know it better than I do, uh, but the idea is that only the systematic risk affects the asset price, meaning only the degree to which the returns of this asset are correlated with the average market returns enters the asset price. Because all the remaining idiosyncratic risk of the asset, the risk which is not correlated with the market returns, can be diversified away with the, uh, through other assets in the portfolio. So that risk is, in a sense, irrelevant for the investors. Um, yeah, so only the systematic risk matters. So now let us see how this works when we account for liquidity. So we will just take the same expression and we will realize that the real returns, small r, which is what the investors care about, are actually given by nominal returns net of the spread. So this is, this corresponds to um, the model that we just saw, where the holding period is equal to 1. So instead of s over h we just have s. 
it's not really important for the uh, results so let us take this approximation so if we plug this relation that we just found into the CAPM equation CAPM equation we get the following so return on asset J becomes expect a difference between nominal return on asset J and uh, spread of asset J risk-free rate remains unchanged and then we have the risk premium given still by beta j plus uh, times the market risk premium so market risk premium denoted by lambda m is um, this thing so it's the expectation between expectation of um, real market return meaning nominal market return minus the spread net of the risk-free rate so the interesting part in this equation will be the beta meaning how exactly do we compute the beta in this um, in this new world so we have that beta is equal to covariance of real returns right it's it should be equal to covariance between the real return on the asset j and uh, real return on the market portfolio but now these real returns are not equivalent to nominal returns but they're also proportional to the spread so let us look at this expression and uh, expand it a little bit so covariance is a linear, linear operator so we just basically open these brackets and we uh, covariance between these two sums is equal to the sum of respective covariances of individual elements so you can expand this covariance to this to four covariances between the individual elements and we respectively end up with the fact that beta the total aggregate beta is composed of four individual betas which correspond to these individual covariances between different elements So the first one is a covariance, the first element of beta, the first contributor to beta, is the covariance between nominal returns on asset J and nominal market returns. So this is your ordinary regular beta. This is what you would get if you just estimated beta based on yeah, nominal uh, returns, nominal market prices. But now we have three more factors that affect the beta that affect the risk premium on the asset so beta 2 depends on the covariance between the spreads between the liquidity of a given asset and liquidity of the market asset so it enters the total with the with a plus and the idea behind it is if you have high beta 2 it means it is beneficial to have an asset sorry if, if it if you have a low beta 2 meaning low covariance then you require lower risk premium on this asset meaning low beta corresponds to kind of good safe asset and here the idea is it's good to have an asset which stays liquid when the market liquidity dries out you value this as an investor so this covariance will be small meaning that or negative meaning that this beta 2 will be small in a sense you can hedge asset liquidity with market liquidity and vice versa or this asset provides a hedge to market liquidity using assets own liquidity you can look at all the other assets in the same way so betas 3 and 4 enter with a negative sign meaning that here it's uh, vice versa it's good to have high betas or high beta 3 and beta 4 correspond to a good safe asset in case of beta 3 is the case that it's um, you want to have an asset which has high nominal returns in bad times in times when market is illiquid when 
market spreads are high so this covariance is large in this case you this asset um, you can use the nominal returns on this asset as a hedge against um, market liquidity and beta 4 is the opposite high beta 4 means that the asset provides um, asset stays liquid when market returns are low so uh, asset liquidity provides a hedge to market returns empirically all of these betas have been estimated and this liquidity cap M model has been estimated as well and um, so one thing you can see is that these new terms that we have they kind of um, work in opposite directions so it might not be that painful uh, you will not have biased you will not have estimates that are too biased if you omit uh, all of these liquidity concerns from your cap M estimate from your betas estimate but empirically uh, it's been shown that all of these betas actually matter that they are all non-zero and the most significant contribution is um, the most significant contribution to returns is typically given by this fourth beta so investors mostly pay attention to uh, hedging market returns with individual asset liquidity so this was liquidity cap M now of course this is still a very reduced form model here we are taking all of the asset returns and spreads as fixed so we are not really they are not endogenous in this model um, so it's really kind of an observational model of how you can better identify and explain the effects in the data rather than explain the fundamental interactions so the big point is that this model is still very limited but it provides some valuable insights just like all other models okay we might actually be able to do all of this today in the end a very quick note on arbitrage the main kind of tenet the the fundamental law of economics and finance is no free lunch there cannot be any arbitrage opportunities assets that generate the same cash flows must cost the same must be priced similarly and the idea is if arbitrage is possible if one can actually um, if, if there are arbitrage opportunities then they are immediately exploited by market participants and this creates a pressure on the prices uh, which eliminates arbitrage so my question to you is how does this relate to our situation in particular think of uh, that case of uh, US Treasury bills versus bonds where you have assets that generate same cash flows but they are priced differently how can we explain this situation from the point of view of arbitrage option one arbitrage opportunities exist in this market because arbitrage is costly to exercise because you know uh, nothing is perfect in the market and even arbitrageurs are subject to frictions option two arbitrage opportunities exist because well you know this fundamental law is wrong and all of economics and finance except our course is also wrong and our models are absolutely correct and we are the only ones who are smart option three well there are actually no arbitrage opportunities in this market so you have 30 seconds to think start <laughs>
We have a lot of ones. Meaning that you all agree with the textbook. The textbook spends an obscene amount of paper arguing that, well, you know, not all arbitrary opportunities exist because there are a lot of costs to arbitrage. It is, it is true, so I do not argue the point that arbitrage is costly. Um, and arbitrage typically requires that you buy one asset and you short sell another asset. And short selling is uh, not an easy operation. So you typically need to put a lot of collateral with the, uh, with the dealer. You need to put a, have a large margin, which imposes basically as financing costs. And all that is for usually very, very small profit. So if there is one cent arbitrage in um, assets that are worth hundred dollars more or less and you know they have hundred uh, six months maturity then you would have to put in uh, what's it the textbook says 150 percent of asset worth to short sell one unit of the asset so you would need 150 dollars in funds to get one cent in six months. This is probably not worth it. And arbitrageurs are trying to operate at really, really high leverage because equity returns are just so small, but it's not always feasible. And there is always also a risk that uh, gap between prices goes in the opposite direction from what you expect it to be. So you see there is an arbitrage and you jump on it, but the price pressure you put on, uh, you put is not enough, and the gap actually widens at some point. Imagine that this is the case, right? This was the case in one of the stories that I uh, gave to read, gave you to read. What then happens is, well, dealers require more collateral because of the riskier position, and then you might be forced to close out your positions as an arbitrageur when actually the potential gains from arbitrage are, are the highest. So this is the point that the textbook makes. I personally kind of disagree with it, with the need to go through all of this argument to explain our situation. So you can go through all this individually to argue that you know some arbitrage might, exi might exist in the markets. But it's, I don't think it's a good explanation for our particular case. And I want to claim that actually no arbitrage opportunities exist in our examples. And my reasoning behind it is that arbitrageurs are subject to all the same trading costs that regular traders are. So these limited liquidity costs, the half spreads, the deviations from asks and bids from the mid quote do not just apply to regular traders, to all participants of the market except for arbitrageurs, right? They apply to arbitrageurs equally, meaning that they are subject to the same costs of trading and they are not able to exploit this arbitrage because of the costs of trading. So this is my take on this. You are free to choose which one you agree with. Um, but yeah, and you are free to try to convince me otherwise in, if you ever have a chance in, in person or in homeworks or in, I know, shoot me an email if you think you, if you think, uh, I'm wrong. But I think that in, in the toy model we saw and in general, it may look as if there is arbitrage, so nominal prices will be different across assets, or might, may be different across assets, but there are no actual arbitrage opportunities that can be exploited by anyone, by any traders in the market. So this is all I want to say about arbitrage potential. And it turns out we have time for the general model.
So to revisit the history. In all the previous lectures, we tried to calculate the spread given the fundamental value of the asset. In part one of today, in our toy model of um, Ami Hood and Pedersen, took me a second to recall. Uh, in that simple model, we calculated the fundamental value in a sense, given the fixed spread. But this is the point, the spread was fixed, so we are fixing one and calculating another. In this model that we will look at now, which is due to Duffy, Gardiano and Pedersen, we will try to calculate both simultaneously. So we will go full in on the cash flow approach. We will have assets that are... We will try to price a given flow of uh, payouts. And we'll try to determine the mid price and the spread at the same time. So we will do this in the context of an OTC market where trade is decentralized. Meaning that you as a trader do not have any particular exchange to go to if you want to trade this asset. And you can think of very illiquid assets which are traded this way, so obscure risky stocks or also derivatives uh, and corporate bonds until recently. So in OTC market, instead of going to some known exchange or a dealer, you have to search for quotes, you have to contact <clears throat> either dealers or other traders individually and you will um, yeah and this kind of search is costly so this relates to uh, quote transparency which we looked at last week we had a kind of a similar search model in there this one is richer and will generate richer predictions so in this market, there is no asymmetric information across agents. Everyone agrees on what the, um, what the cash flow is. So where does the spread come from? Here, search costs give market power to the dealers. Once again, as we saw last week. Here it will be less drastic, but still. And this market power will be the force that will produce spread. So let us jump into the model. In this model we have one asset which pays dividends each period. The traders or investors are heterogeneous and there is a continuum of them. Some traders are um, value dividends highly, so they value dividend that's paid each period at one. And some other traders have lower value for these dividends for some reason that we do not specify. But as usual, you, you can think liquidity concerns, so these traders need to need some liquid funds, or due to their risk portfolio, but for one reason or another, they value the dividend in any given period at 1 minus C. And C is between 0 and 1, so their value is between 0 and 1. Now, any trader, any investor in this model can hold either zero or one unit of the asset. So there is no short selling and there is no stockpiling. You either hold the asset or you don't. Traders always have an outside option of uh, going to the bank and it pays interest R and this is the required rate of return on our asset. This will be the required rate of return. So again, the opportunity cost of money. And here we will assume that the asset is supplied to a fraction Q of the population and we will say that this Q is um, less than one half, which will matter very soon. So aggregate supply. Q is the aggregate supply of the asset. Now, the dynamics in this model, the reasons to trade in this model, will come from the fact that traders can change their value for the asset. So high-value traders may become low-value traders and vice versa. 
your risk portfolio changes over time, your liquidity needs change over time. And so we will assume that this follows, this transition is a Markov process. And in any given period with probability Psi, your value changes. If you were high, you become low value. If you had low value, you get high value. And with probability 1 minus Psi, your value stays the same. So what it means is that in the long run, half the traders will have high value. Let us really quickly derive this. So this will be Duffy, Gurliano and Pedersen. Okay, I know it's a little bit cut, but uh, yeah, that's better. Okay, so suppose that we have uh, pi h high uh, value investors in the steady state and the share of low value investors is pi l. Shares of high and low value investors in the steady state. So we are assuming that the economy is in some kind of steady state. So even if there were some shares of high and low value investors initially, uh, in the long run they will converge to somewhere, to a steady state. It has something to do with ergodicity of this process. So these are the shares of high and low value investors in the steady state and we are trying to find them. Obviously pH and pi L must sum up to 1. And um, in the steady state, these shares are the same from one period to the next, meaning that pi H, the share of investors at the, uh, in the next period must be equal to the share of investors that were high, that had high valuation in the previous period and uh, third times the charm and remained high value investors so that they had high value and their value did not change I think it was actually 1 minus Psi was it plus investors that had low valuations and their value changed so Pi L times Psi and you will have a similar equation for the um, for pi l so pi l must be equal to pi l times 1 minus psi what is happening i i forgot how to type sorry plus pi h times psi you don't really need both of these one of these equations is enough But what we can get from these is, say, from the first one, take pi, uh, all terms with pi h to the left-hand side, and you will get pi h 1 minus 1 plus psi must be equal to pi l times psi. You can see that these ones annihilate on the left-hand side, so pi h times psi must be equal to pi l times psi meaning that in the end pi h must be equal to pi l and since they must sum up to 1 uh, it follows that pi h and pi l are both one half so in the long run in the steady state of the economy exactly half of the investors have high value for the asset and another half have uh, low value for the asset going back to the slides so we just showed this and the reason why this uh, 
change in value generates trade, is that you would assume that only those who have high value for the asset will want to trade, so will want to hold the asset, while those who have low value for the asset will not want to hold it. So we need this kind of uh, heterogeneity in incentives, because aggregate supply of the asset is positive, so somebody should be willing to hold the asset, but aggregate supply is less than one, and less than one half. So it is impossible that all agents will hold the asset. So in equilibrium of our economy, it will, it must be the case that some agents will hold the asset and some of them won't. So it's a natural start to assume that high value traders will hold the asset, will want to hold the asset and low value traders will not. And what this implies is if you have high value and you don't have an asset, you want to buy it. And this might be the case if you were low value in the previous period and your value changed. And so your being low value is the reason that you did not have the asset. But this will be this will drive you to the market with a will to buy. While if you were high asset, uh, if you were a high value trader and you had an asset and suddenly you became low value, then you would be willing to trade. So this is what generates willingness to trade in our model. And how trade proceeds is that if you want to trade in a given period, you will be searching for a dealer, meaning you basically go to the market and with some probability you will find a dealer. So with probability phi you will find a dealer who will uh, trade with you. But otherwise you will find no one and you will have to be stuck with your current position for one more period and suffer from not getting high dividend or getting a low dividend. So this is um, the search friction in our model. We do not have explicit search costs, but the search costs are implicit in uncertainty, in the uncertainty of finding a dealer. So if you reject the offer that it, you hear from the dealer today, you risk not meeting another dealer tomorrow. This is what gives dealers the market power. So, this is a slightly uh, sophisticated model. There are somewhat many moving parts. So let us give an explicit timing of how things happen. We'll say that in any given period, First of all, the investor receives the dividend payoff, then their valuation might change, and then they decide whether to trade or not, whether to go search for a dealer or not. Now the exact timing does not matter, you can change it however you want, it will just affect uh, the solution process slightly, and the prices slightly, but not in a super meaningful way. So, as I just said, dealers have some bargaining power because they're hard to find, hard to find. We'll say that they quote some ask and bid prices, A and B, and the spread that arises is given by capital S. And we will assume that there is also some bargaining power parameter. So, if there are gains from trade in a given um, relationship. If kind of both sides, both dealer and trader have some market power, then they split the surplus from trade according to a parameter Z or Z. Um, I forgot which exactly it is, So, but it's either the trader gets share Z of the surplus and the dealer gets 1 minus Z or vice versa. So we'll see it in a second. But for another notation, let's uh, introduce A bar and B bar as the high, uh, sorry, yeah, highest possible ask and the lowest possible bid that the traders will agree to pay for the asset or pay or accept. So these will be the values that uh, set them at exact indifference. 
on whether to trade or not. And we'll define the mid price as the center point between these two edge cases, not the realized S can bid A and B, but between A bar and B bar. So now we get to some of the meat of the paper, of the model. So we have Q smaller than one half. Or let's take another step back. We uh, assumed so far that agents with the high value for the asset will want to hold the asset and those with the low value will want to not hold the asset. This could have been an equilibrium if um, aggregate supply of the asset was exactly equal to the share to the number of high value um, agents in the society, of high value investors on the market. However, what we assumed is that aggregate supply Q is less than one half, meaning that not all high value investors will get to hold the asset. So the only way in which this can happen in our model is that when a buyer, when a trader is willing to buy the asset, when they come to the dealer and they are quoted the ask price, they must be indifferent between buying or not buying. So, in other words, they must be indifferent between holding the asset or not holding the asset. Because if they would be strictly willing to hold the asset, they would, those without the asset would go to the market and be willing to buy. And so the dealer has to sell them the asset at the quoted price, or uh, has to quote some price to them and has to sell them the asset at that price if the buyer chooses to buy. But there are not enough assets to go around, which means that some of these buyers must be ready to not search for the asset. Some of the high value investors must be ready uh, yeah, to forego the asset. This will happen if the actual ask price, A, that the dealer quotes, is equal to the maximal ask price that the buyer is willing to pay that the high value agent is willing to pay for the asset. So we will have A equal to A bar. And we will denote PB, uh, the probability that the um, buyer trades. We'll say that it's conditional on finding a dealer. So we'll say that all of these buyers still go to the market and search for a dealer, but conditional on finding one, they may or may not trade. This does not really matter, because search is costless. There is no actual monetary cost to go into the market and looking for a dealer. So in our equilibrium, this probability of trading must be such that, uh, so it must be, so as to equalize the trade flows in the market. So in a given period, we have some investors holding the asset. And one assumption that I did not articulate is that dealers are assumed to be unable to hold inventory. So all dealers at the end of the period should clear their positions, they cannot hold the asset. And one assumption is that they, they might trade with each other to clear these positions, but they will um, clear these trades at this mid price mu. This is an exogenous assumption. This does not come from anywhere. We're just assuming this. So mu is the value that um, is the value of the asset to the dealer. So going back to the timing, what will happen is in previous period, some agents ended up holding the asset and some agents ended up without the asset. Now a new period begins. Some agents types change. Some of the high types become low types and they are willing to sell the asset. So we'll allow all of them to sell the asset, conditional on finding a dealer. And so there will be phi 
times psi times ps pi s of those or more or less of the agents willing to sell so we want to have the exact same number of agents willing to buy the asset in order for the market to clear in order for the dealers to be to be able to clear their positions by the end of the period which leads us to this equilibrium trading probability PB so we have um, phi times psi times pi s agents willing to sell we have phi times PB of the uh, buyers who actually went to the market uh, now I'm starting to get confused Sorry, I added this clarifier that this probability is conditional on finding a dealer. It might be unconditional probability. I will think about it some more after the lecture and uh, let you know. But the bottom line, this probability, this trading strategy, must be such that so as to equalize the um, trading flows in the market, so as to clear the market. So we looked at the buy side. We established that this ask price will be so as to make the potential buyers indifferent and we will still we are still yet to determine the a bar on the sell side there is no such constraint so sellers are privileged there are fewer of them than there are buyers meaning that sellers can get some uh, profit they have some market power but then so have the dealers so in this interaction both agents have some power and that's where this bargaining parameter comes into play. So what we will assume is that in this interaction between a seller and a dealer trades happens uh, so as to split the surplus according to Z. So the resulting bid price will be between B bar and mu with weight Z. So you can think of the seller's profit being B bar uh, minus B. So if the seller sells at B bar, no, sorry, B minus B bar, that's the seller's profit. So if the seller sells at B bar, uh, this makes the seller exactly indifferent. So he gains utility of net utility of zero from sale. While if he sells at B, he gets effectively utility B minus B bar, right? Everything on top of B bar is the seller's profit. Dealer's profit, on the other hand, is mu minus B. So the dealer, after the sale, will end up holding the asset that he will then sell on the interdealer market at price mu. And the price that the dealer pays for the, um, pays for the asset is B. So the dealer's profit is mu minus b. And basically what we are assuming here is that z... I should probably write this. z times b minus bar b is equal to 1 minus z times b uh, times mu minus b. So profits of the seller and the dealer are, are tied according to this relationship. And this is our interpretation of uh, market power Z. So if Z is very large, this B minus B bar is very small to equate with the rest of these. And then Z is the bargaining power of the dealer. When Z is high, the seller gets very very little profit very small share of the surplus while the dealer will get a lot of the surplus and vice versa okay so once again we are still yet to determine the b bar to find out the actual bid price in equilibrium uh, sorry i know i'm going over time but i wanted to take this model very slowly and i think i'll need another 10 minutes or so so feel free to stick around, otherwise, as usual, there will be a video uploaded exposed.
and you can see it exposed. But I want to take this model slowly and I want it to finish it in one sitting. So I will just press on. So, we want to find an equilibrium of this model, meaning that we want to identify A bar and B bar, and then we will be able to solve for ask and bid prices uh, using what we just did. So this is where value functions come into play. Let us use capital V's to denote the value that the agent with a given type and uh, position has. Meaning VJ Yeah, sorry. VJO would be the discounted cash flow value of the asset as of the beginning of the period of a trader whose value for the asset is J and the trader actually owns the asset. So the trader holds the asset at the beginning of the period. VJ0, VJO, it should be O, is how much the trader would be willing to pay for this asset. Similarly, VJNO would be how much a trader with valuation J, high or low, who does not currently own the asset, is willing to pay for the asset. So basically VJNO is uh, how much you're willing to pay to get the asset. VJO is approximately how much you value the asset at, so how much you require to sell the asset. But these are not exactly. So these will not correspond to A bar and B bar because No, sorry, I tried to reformulate to make it a little easier and I regret I did this. So these are not exactly really the discounted cash flow values. These are just value functions of a given asset. Oh, uh, sorry, of a given trader. So let me start once again. VGO is a value of trader with private valuation J who currently holds the asset, currently owns the asset. And this is their discounted lifetime utility. This is not really how much they're willing to pay for the asset. This is their discounted lifetime utility. This is how much dividend they will get from either holding the asset or actually trading the asset optimally now and in the future. Similarly, VJNO is the value, so discounted lifetime utility, of trader with valuation J who currently does not own the asset. So these values are tied with these following relationships. Um, basically, if you start holding the asset and say your valuation is high, you have total lifetime val uh, valuation VHO. If you decide to sell the asset, sorry, vice versa, if you start we are assuming that... Uh, I apologize for all the confusion. I apparently did not spend enough time going through this model in my head. If What we are assuming is that traders with high valuation are the buyers in our model. So our A bar was the maximal price that they would be willing to pay for the asset. How do we compute this price? If you start... If you are a high valuation trader and you start with not owning the asset, your lifetime discounted utility is VHNO, right? If instead you are granted the asset now, so if you had the asset right now, then your value would actually be VHO, which is presumably higher. So how much you're willing to pay for the asset is exactly the difference between the two. Because this difference is exactly how much the asset is worth to you. So this will give us the A bar. And similarly, we are assuming that the sell side of the market is composed with is composed of low valuation traders, low valuation investors, who 
suddenly became low valuation investors and want to sell the asset that they bought when they were when they had high valuation for the dividends. So what happens here is the value of holding the asset for the low valuation traders is VLO. And if they sell the asset, they end up with value VLNO. And all of these values of not holding the asset, just to be clear, they incorporate the future possibility that you become, that the trader becomes high valuation and so has a chance to buy the asset and so on. So all of these values account for that. The difference between these two values for the low for the for the low valuation trader is exactly this low valuations valuation traders value for the asset so this seller would require at least b bar to be willing to sell the asset because if they are offered if they are offered a bid of lower than b bar they would be better off uh, with the asset. So this is how we find A bar and B bar. And then we find ask and bid price from the formulas that we already have. So in these expressions we just um, plugged in A bar and B bar into the expressions that we had already. No rocket science here. So what we now need to do is to actually compute these value functions. VHO, VLO, VHNO, and VLNO. We have four of those. We will look at two. In particular, we will look at the high value trader uh, because then all the value functions for the low value trader will. you'll be able to derive them in a similar way. So let's see, how does. Um, how does the lifetime utility of the high value trader how is it determined when he owns the asset well first of all when he owns the asset he receives a dividend which he values at one then after the dividend with probability one minus psi he remains high type mean that he does not want to go to the market he wants to hold to the asset in this case in the next period he receives VHO this will be his lifetime utility from that point onwards with probability Psi though his type changes so instead of high valuation he becomes low valuation investor his value for all future dividends decreases meaning that he now wants to sell the asset. So he goes to the market with probability 1 minus phi. He does not find any dealer. And so he receives VLO. In the beginning of the next period, he becomes a low value investor who owns the asset. So he receives VLO respectively. But with probability phi, conditional on becoming low type, he finds a dealer after he goes to the market, so he succeeds in selling the asset, meaning that he receives price B from the trade, and at the beginning of the next period is a low value investor who does not own the asset, meaning that he receives VLNO. So this is in a sense a recursive, uh, recurrent formulation of values. I presume that you've seen value functions before so it should not be rocket science and then one plus r everywhere is a normalization constant so that's what we end up with in the steady state uh, for the value of the to find the value of the high valuation investor who does not currently own the asset uh, we proceed in a similar way, so at the beginning of the period this investor receives no dividend because he holds no asset. Then with probability Psi 
he becomes a low-value trader who does not own the asset, so he does not want to go to the market. He does not, he does not want to hold the asset when he's low type, so he receives VL and O in the beginning of the next period. With probability 1 minus Psi, uh, he remains high value, which means that he goes to the market and trades in the end with probability PB. So from this formulation, I guess PB uh, uh, PB denotes the total probability of trade, total probability that the high value investor buys the asset in a given period, which kind of absorbs the probability of finding a dealer. Which is a slightly weird formulation, but let's stick with it. So with this probability 1 minus PB, the uh, trader does not find any asset, fails to buy the asset, and so he, at the beginning of the next period he is H and O, high value trader with no asset, so he receives VH and O. And with probability 1 minus Psi times PB, he remains a high type, goes to the market and succeeds in buying the asset, so he receives VHO minus A bar. So this gives us two values. We have two more equations, similar equations for the low type. Not exactly similar, because the low type behaves differently, but similar enough. And so once you have all of these four equations, you have four variables, so four values that you need to find. You write them all up, system of four equations and four variables, you solve it which we will not do right now, right here. Uh, and once you find the values, you are able to plug these values into A bar and B bar to find the ask and bid prices in the market. So what you end up if you, what you end up with if you do all of that is the following. The ask price in the market, just to pick one, the ask price will be given by 1 over R, which is uh, the value of holding the asset forever when you are a high valuation trader currently. So if you had a high valuation for the asset you, and you think, you know what, I have no reason to sell it ever because I have high valuation for the dividends, you would expect that this would be your valuation for the asset and this would be the ask price in the market. However, what happens in our market is that these high valuation traders they actually realize that at some point in the future they are likely to face either a liquidity shock or their risk portfolio might change, so they would be willing to sell the asset. They would have low valuation for these dividends. And all of this leads to ask price having this uh, term, this discount. And we interpret this discount as a liquidity premium or in a sense liquidity discount for the ask price right because this is exactly this if if when I become a low valuation investor I am able to sell my asset to someone who just became high value who just received high valuation so if there was no friction in the market due to search costs for dealers, then we would not have this term. So even if I would realize that at some point my evaluation would become low, I would know that you know I would be able to sell the asset at a fair price to another dealer, so uh, we would not have this term. But we have it and this is the liquidity discount. Yeah, there is a lot of um, interpretation that you can look at here. A lot of parameters that you can do comparative statics with respect to. Uh, furthermore, this ask price is expressed in terms of the spread, which in terms, which in turn depends on the ask price. So ideally, you would want to plug the spread in there and then do all the comparative statics. I am way, way over time right now, so I will not do that. But this will be an exercise for you at home to explain how the ask price depends on all of the parameters that we have in the model 
and why this is the case. Overall, today we have um, found out that liquidity might affect the valuation that assets uh, that investors have for the asset, and low liquidity assets might um, require a liquidity premium, meaning they must be traded at a lower price. And furthermore, there might even be such thing as a liquidity risk premium, meaning that investors might require a premium to trade in assets which have very volatile liquidity. So this is generally an important uh, risk for the investors, for the regulators to take into account. And uh, let us finish today. So one exercise for you that we'll probably cover in one of the exercise classes, although no promises, is to look at exercise one from chapter nine. So this is a relatively simple exercise on um, Amihud and Pedersen model. And it uh, explores what happens if you add dividends to that model. So if you recall, we had zero coupon bonds there. And uh, in this exercise, you will also have dividends. So nothing will change drastically. It's just an exercise for you to make sure you know how to solve things. Okay, thank you for sticking around. Sorry for going over time. Um, as usual, I'll stick around for questions for another few minutes. But otherwise, I will see you next week and happy Easter!